It is good to have everybody back with us, whether you are here in the sanctuary in this massive crowd that we have, uh, or whether you're uh, worshiping with us online. Uh, I just appreciate your faithfulness and I appreciate you being with us and tuning in every week. Um, those of you that have been watching online, you really got used to, to seeing the sermon get posted at 10.30 on a Sunday morning. Well, we can't do that anymore because we record it on Sunday morning and then it's processed on Sunday afternoon. So just about supper time, when you're sitting down to a nice big plate of fried chicken and mashed potatoes and gravy and a biscuit or two, you're able to sit and watch the service. And hopefully you're hearing something that will touch your heart and will help you to grow and uh, to be drawn closer to God. You know, some of the baggage that we haul around with us gives us anxiety about things that are really out of our control. We've talked about all the things that we've chosen to pick up and carry. We've talked about all the things that, that we've wondered about and, and drug along with us and, and just keep accumulating. When we feel anxious, instead of bottling it up and keeping it within us, we should cast it on Jesus and trust Him to handle it. Just like the song, Give Them All to Jesus that Evie Tornquist made uh, quite popular. I'd like for us to share just a brief prayer. God, for too long we've been trying to control our own life and to deal with our own baggage. Thank you for the invitation you give us to cast our cares upon you. Put us in a position to be willing to give up the things that we are wrestling with and seek help in carrying our baggage. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Welcome to our third and final week of our baggage series. And as a kind of a brief recap of our first two weeks, I would like to share this one sentence with you, and it is this. Let go of the baggage in your life and travel freely into a life filled with expectation and anticipation of all that God can do in and through you. That's a one sentence summary of what we've been looking at for the last two weeks. But we need to be honest for just a moment about something. There are some of us here and some of us that are listening this morning that um, we've been hearing for a long time that greener pastures are ahead. Things are going to get better. Things are just getting ready to turn a corner, right? We've been hearing that now for months. Are you getting as tired of hearing that as I am? <laughs> I want to see something. I want to experience something. Quite honestly, truth be told, we are all plain tired. We really are. You can, you can try to tag a lot of emotional terms to, to the way that we're feeling and the way that we're living, but in all honesty, we're all tired. Yeah. And our patience is wearing a little thin. I got into an argument the other day with one of our birds. <laughs> it was a female bird, she won. <laughs> But we don't have answers, do we? We want to believe. We know that God is good. But sometimes we're just not sure where to begin. If that sounds like you, I'm glad you're here. And I'm glad you're listening. Because here's the bottom line, folks. Jesus cares for you Jesus wants the best for you in wholeness and abundant life. 
So let's keep those truths in mind as we talk more about casting our cares on the Creator. And I use the word Creator deliberately. I'm not trying to minimize saying God the Father. I'm not trying to minimize God the Holy Spirit. I'm not trying to memorize God the Son in Jesus. I'm not trying to minimize all that. There is something about the statement that we are to trust our Creator or trust the Creator that seems to open up an expanse that our mind can't seem to get completely around. It's an easy concept to think of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We can do that. We can even cope as best as we can with the term Trinity. But when we say we are going to trust in the Creator, It's almost as if the entire universe can be pictured in God's hands. When we talk about the Creator. So if we're placing our trust in the Creator, then we have to understand that all things that have been created by His hand, all that is, is still under his control. Would you agree? The creation will never be greater or equal to the creator. The creator is at the apex. So first of all, God calls upon us to use humility. When we realize that God, the, the creator, is as big as he is, we begin feeling quite small. As we identify the baggage in our, our lives, let it go and trust God with your future. There is something else. There is an imperative ingredient to the mix that we cannot see in this surrender. And it's this. Humility. Humility. Now, we have all undergone things in our life where we are humbled. We've either done something, said something, behaved a particular way, got caught at it, and our humility really came to the top because we were embarrassed, uh, we felt like an idiot, we felt foolish. I was in the parking lot of a, of a shopping center in Durango one time, and there was a really nice metallic blue Thunderbird, the big Thunderbird. Remember the, with the with headlight covers and big long hood? I mean, the thing had about a seven-foot hood on it, and it had the opera glass in the, on the back, part of the top and there was only one person that I knew that had that car it was a young lady in our church so I blew my horn as they went past I couldn't really see the driver but I blew my horn their brake lights came on and I was waiting for them to roll the window down turn around look never happened they kept driving I thought well I'll just follow them through the parking lot so I followed him through the park, parking lot, kept blowing my horn. Followed that car around the parking lot twice until it came up and parked at the front door of the store. And I pulled up alongside, and it wasn't her. <laughs> All I could say was, I'm so sorry. I'm really not stalking you. I thought you were someone else. That was a humbling experience. And I'm sure that every one of you could tell stories similar. 
all of us need to be willing to ask for help and it is not an easy thing to do for many of us who are so headstrong and independent and let's just call it what it is bullheaded we're there part of it quite honestly is because of our age you can say amen because you know it's true <laughs> the older we get we've been through a lot right and our patience gets short and we've learned if you don't stick up for yourself nobody else will right so you have all of that going on in the back of your mind and it has created a bullheadedness a headstrong attitude and a streak of independence a mile wide down our back while that may be a good thing to navigate tough days it is not a good attitude to approach God with we need to be willing to ask him for help and quite honestly we also need to be willing to ask someone else for help because you asking for help admits that you need the help and do you realize it's a compliment to the person that you asked do you know that that just elevated their sense of well-being because you tell them that you trust them enough I, I need your help So not only humility in being able to ask for help, but humility in being able to seek out your blind spots. Sometimes this comes to light, again, through people. We do not like to admit that we have blind spots. Blind spots sounds really nice. Do you know what it really boils down to? Faults. <laughs> we don't want to admit we have faults but we do and it takes humility to admit them it also takes humility to get untangled from sin because you see we need to turn our backs on sin because sin is a snare and we can't win against sin without God's help we can't fight that battle we need God's help and we also need humility to move forward in order to make progress no retreat now we're there we can handle that one. Oh, I'm not giving up but sometimes we feel like our feet are in cement when it comes to our spiritual walk because we just stop and we don't see any need to progress we don't see any need for growth now in fact first Peter chapter 5 verse 6 and 7 it's there on your bulletin and it'll pop up on the screen if everything goes well first Peter 5 6 and 7 identifies humility before casting your cares on Jesus listen to this so humble yourselves under the mighty power of God and at the right time he will lift you up in honor give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about you who first Peter 5 6 and 7 so we're supposed to have humility in the fact that we're asking for God's help to have the humility before we cast our cares on him now as you know it's difficult to work with someone who is all puffed up with pride we've all known those kind of people they're difficult to deal with do you think it would be any different in your own relationship with God don't you think that we should be able to put our pride aside when we come to God and yet sometimes don't we feel like we have to justify our prayer 
Don't we feel at times like, I need to explain this to you, God. <laughs> Let me tell you my side of the story, Lord, before we unpack all of this together. Let me tell you my side of the story. And we rationalize. <laughs> so it should not be any different in our relationship with God. We need to have humility. And we need to put off a puffed up attitude and pride. The answer, of course, is no. We should not have that. In all of this, including the life of discipleship, it takes an enormous amount of humility. This is something that Jesus knew and he modeled it for us in becoming human and giving his life for us. You read through scripture what Jesus went through and then try to tell me that he didn't have humility? What he put up with? What he faced? A tremendous amount of humility. And he modeled that for us. It has been said that humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. <laughs> not thinking less of yourself but thinking of yourself less. Yeah, I mean, we all have to think about ourselves. I mean, we take care of ourselves, how we, how we dress, what we eat, how we exercise, all of those things. We, we are told that we are to think about ourselves and to think highly of ourselves. The scripture just says, don't think more highly of yourself than you should. So thinking of yourself less. Now there are six attributes of a healthy humility for you to think about. Here they are. Six of them. Healthy humility. You acknowledge that you don't have it all together. Just, yep. I don't have it all together. You know the difference between self-confidence and pride. You seek to add value to others. You take responsibility for your own actions. You understand the shadow side of success, meaning success can just kind of cause you to just, you know, your head gets bigger. And the last one, you're filled with gratitude for what you do have. You're filled with gratitude with what you do have. So I have a couple of questions. In that list, anything ring a bell? Did you see yourself in any one or more than one or maybe all? Yeah. We're there. The second question, where do you feel like you could grow in your humility? <laughs> where could you grow in your... That's not even a comfortable question. Because you know in order to grow in humility, you're going to have to humble yourself and do something that in your mind you think is beneath you. Hmm. Well, now that I've beaten you up on that point. Number two, God calls upon us to throw it all on Jesus. Give it all to Jesus. Once we have the humility thing all lined up, and you know you need some assistance dealing with your baggage, here's the next step. Once you have identified it, one or all of those six, any of those things that we've covered, give it to Jesus. Pick it up and throw it on Him. It seems simple enough, right? It's a good thing to say. Just give it to God. Isn't that an amazing thing? Isn't that encouraging? How many of you do that every time? Well, let me wrestle with it for a while. <laughs> I can fix this. 
God, I, I, I don't want to bother you with this. I can, I can handle this. It takes determination and it really does take a great amount of humility of being able to come to God and say I need your help so what does it look like how does it work when we say throw everything on him how does that work one example that comes to mind is found in the Gospel of Luke and we're going to look, take a look here at Luke chapter 10 verses 38 through 42. And it reads this way. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Luke 10, 38 through 42. So look at the example that was set by Mary. While her sister is worried and bothered by all kinds of things, Mary is seated at the feet of Jesus. Now, we could really get off into the brush here and I could, I could go in a completely different de de uh, destination, different direction. But let me, just, let me just mention this for a second. What got in the way, what got in the way of Martha sitting at the feet of Jesus with Mary? What got in the way? nothing bad her sense of duty she wanted to honor Jesus by what she was doing she wanted to cook a good meal I cannot imagine a southern woman not wanting to do the absolute best everything's going to look perfect Jesus is here like having the preacher over for lunch it's got to be perfect right Hey, you feed a preacher fried chicken, you got his attention. But what, what could have gotten in her way? It was all the things that she saw as being important that her sister saw as being overshadowed by the presence of Jesus. It wasn't that they weren't important. It was just that there was something more important. And that was what Jesus recognized Mary for. What a beautiful picture and what a powerful lesson to learn. To do just this. To make time for Jesus. Sit with him and his word. Pray. Maybe journal. I know several of you like journaling. Read. Tell him the things that you're anxious about, thinking about, worried and bothered by. This discipline was even modeled by Christ while he was here on earth. He would regularly, we find out, he would regularly go off to be with the Father. You can find that in the first chapter of Mark. Jesus would take time to go off to be alone with his heavenly Father. Should we have any different approach different thinking we all need those times to get off with God and just like Jesus recognizes in Mary's time spent with him which this he says shall not be taken away from her we understand any time spent with Christ is time well spent and here again we ask two more questions I love questions what can you do this week to have more intentional time with Christ. What could you do? 
What areas of concern and baggage are you carrying right now that you would like to give to him, but for some reason you've just decided to just... Maybe you're not carrying them. Maybe you just have them sitting beside where you are. Well, I'm not carrying them, Lord. I'm just going to leave them right there. Well, why don't you walk away from them? Well, I need to keep an eye on them. I want to make sure I know where they are. Which brings us to the last point. God expects us to trust Him. We ended last week's sermon with a similar point, and we talked about trust in week one as well. It shouldn't come as a surprise then that trust is a significant obstacle in the process of offloading our baggage. Admittedly, I don't, I, I don't see things happening quickly. I know that trust can take time. And for some, it doesn't come easy at all. They learn, but it takes a while. There are times when trust is not warranted when it comes to people because people can disappoint you, can't they? You can be blindsided. You can say, well, I'm going to trust. Is anybody here this morning or anybody that's watching this video, have you ever once been in a position where somebody betrayed you? Maybe just one. Think about it. Just one. Truth be known, you've probably been disappointed by a lot of people in your life. And trust can be an issue, can it? Because of your past. There are times when our trust has been betrayed with people. In his book titled The Speed of Trust, Stephen Covey writes, Low trust causes friction. Low trust is the greatest cost in life and in organizations, including families. Low trust creates hidden agendas, politics, interpersonal conflict, win-lose thinking, defensive and protective communication, all of which reduce the speed of trust. Low trust slows everything, every decision, every communication, and every relationship. It says every, including our relationship with God. It can slow that down if we cannot learn to trust. So we have three more questions. Have you ever experienced low trust in your life? Yep, been there. Have you seen the damage that it has done in your life? Yes. Have you observed the impact of low trust in your relationships? Do you see somebody you'd really like to have a relationship with, but there's something back here that says, I just, I, I can't trust. Right? We've been there. Covey goes on to say, simply put, trust means confidence. And the opposite of trust is distrust. And this is suspicion. Are you suspicious of God? Are you just waiting for Him to drop the hammer on you? Well, I'd really like to trust the Lord, but you think He's going to reprimand you? You think He's going to take everything good from you because He's trying to teach you a lesson? Wow. I know it may sound simple, but God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And you will experience trouble, adversity, and frustration in your life. You will have your trust betrayed. No one can avoid them. The promise we get to enjoy as sons and daughters of the Most High King is that this is found in Romans 8.28. And it says this. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. 
So you see, there are four mandates in our life. Trust Him today. Cast your cares on Him today. Toss your baggage on to Jesus today. And choose to walk with Him today. Now. Today. In the moment. God wants us to know that He cares for us today. He wants what's best for you today. He will meet all of your needs today. Physical, emotional, spiritual. So think about this for a moment. <clears throat> if God didn't care, would He share His one and only Son with you? If Jesus didn't care, would He have humbled Himself to the point of death for you? So our challenge for every one of us is to let go of the suspicion and the doubt, to let go of the baggage and to trust Jesus with our life today and every day thereafter. We take every day, one day at a time, and God has it all handled. Why? Because He is the Creator. And He has everything under control. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank You so much for the promises that we find in these passages, the truth that we find in Your Word, the ways in which, Lord, You keep us going when we don't know where our next step is going to come from. We need to learn to trust more to follow you, to lean upon you, and to realize that our lives are lived day by day. Worrying about tomorrow and carrying the baggage of yesterday stifles everything in our life. So, oh God, as we have learned in these past three weeks, we have learned that baggage is carried by a choice. Surrender is a choice. Following you is a choice. Help us, O oh God, by your strength to always choose wisely, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Be not dismayed,
you through every day.